here to talk about church architecture, religious architecture. Um, today's kind of the sub theme is an exercise in balance, and we'll understand that better in a few minutes. But I wanted to start out today looking at some uh, pictures. But actually, before that, even you know, it's an adult Christian education class. We should talk about Christian education, right? Um, so I looked in the Bible. There's almost nothing about how to build buildings in the Bible. You know, the Old Testament has some stuff, but it's more about who doesn't get to build a wall or who doesn't get to build a temple and how big the temple is. If you ever look at it, the temple's huge. The, the original temple is huge. Um, makes me feel better about doing architecture today. What about the ark? Yeah, there's... Oh, the ark, yes. Yeah. Exactly, but not, not so much. And if you look at the New Testament, really, you almost come away thinking we shouldn't be building. You know, it's all about small group meetings and homes and things like that. But if we accept that, that we need our uh, church architecture in the modern age as kind of a modern conceit, then let's look at what that really kind of looks like. So we're going to start with, when people think about church architecture, what is it? <laughs> Everybody thinks about this, knows about this. It, it, to a lot of people, it's kind of the epitome of church architecture. I don't like it. <laughs> Honestly, but when we went in, I was kind of like, okay, yeah. And by then, we've been to like 15, 16, 17 churches, and it's like, oh, it's another one, it is big. <laughs> and I'd always been told how glorious the windows were because, you know, full flying arches and getting thin walls and a lot of glass, that's the hallmark of Notre Dame. And I was kind of underwhelmed. I thought, there's not as much glass as I expected. So, anyway, that's kind of the classic church. So, is this church? Is church architecture? Yeah, I, I think so. It's the built environment with a purpose for worshiping God. So, one end of the spectrum to the other. Okay, so when a lot of us think about churches, and especially in America, this is kind of the idealized church, you know, the spire. What is it about this that says church? The spire, the steeple, windows. windows. Yeah, and, and yet, you know, there's, there's, some Notre Dame here. You know, there's the, the, the pointed arches, the mosaic <coughs> window kind of format, and we were talking a little bit ahead of time that I, I hate history, and I hate architecture history more than anything. It's the reason I almost flunked out of college. <laughs> <laughs> but going and seeing them in person really helped all, all of those things that I learned in college, um, all those buildings that I studied, they come to life a little bit more as you experience them in real life. And that's actually, to me, Architectural photos are a lie. <laughs> Invariably, they're a lie. Um, let, me, let me show you an example of that. Here is a lie. Anybody, first of all, anybody know what that is? I feel like an architecture history class. Who built it, when was it built, and for who? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hated about architecture history. I love the idea of architecture history, not the details. It's not. This is in Paris. Give you a hand. It's on the island with... Saint-Chapelle. Saint-Chapelle, there we go. But, the reason nobody knows this is because the only way you can see this is through my helicopter. Okay? The experience of Saint Chapelle, and how many have been there in Paris? Okay, what the experience is what? You go in through a security gate, across a little narrow courtyard next to this building, and if you stop and look way up, you have some sense that there's something over your head. But it's kind of like visiting the uh, um, the, the Red Wing. You know, you see this big thing, and you know that there's a tree at the top of it, but you can't see it. So it's a little bit like that here. When you come in, you walk along this side, and you come around the other side, and you go in the basement. And what's that like? It's horrible. <laughs> it's dark, it's gloomy, and, you know, I even sold on this, Ron and Susan, before we went, said, this is the best church you're going to go see. So we walk in this place, and it's like 10 feet tall, arched, gloomy, old, rotten stone, and a few things about how the church was built. And then you go up this narrow little winding stairway in the corner, which, you know, you don't even know where that is. There's nothing that says you go this way to get there. You go up and you walk in. And it is glorious. Glorious. Thank you. It's unbelievable. And this is kind of what I was expecting from Notre Dame. With all the glass, and this glass goes around you 360. And you can spend hours there. And I never even got to the detail of the glass. You know, if you wanted to look, this is all, this is the early projector. You know, 
we use the projector to put up words and images. This is education for the, the masses, you know, the illiterate. The stories were told in the stained glass. So I, and I never even got to that level of detail. I was just awed by being in this space. But the only people that would understand it from this level or have an approach that's not that basement kind of circular approach was the king, who had his own balcony that opened into this. Sorry, I'm getting kind of off track. What is it? It's a church. <laughs> so we go from this to this. But it's still church, right? You know how it's church? It's this right here. <laughs> that's the only way I would know that's a church. Okay, so what's this? It's easy. No, it's an office building. <laughs> church, office building, church, office building. Not the same. Where okay. is that church that you just showed? Oh, see, I don't know. That's our picture history. Um, I could look it up for you. I mean, I just I just did a Google search for images. It's um, somebody's Methodist church, but I can't quite make out who. United Methodist. But it's kind of fun. Um, so, office building. What's it? Sports stadium. She's been there, so she knows. <laughs> it is a sports stadium. So, if that's a sports stadium, what's that? Church. It's a church. church. <laughs> sports stadium, church. Hey, that's a church. You know, honestly, there have been, there've been services in this space. That's, if you care, that's the Stade de France. It's the big, where they hope to put the Olympics. Um, very nice building. Uh, Sunday afternoon. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. And for some people, sports are a religion. So, so here again, how do you know it's a church? Yes. Some sense of injury, the cross, and the uh, New Faith Baptist Church International, which is why it looks like an airport. <laughs> okay, what is it? It's a church. Most of these are going to be churches, right? Because we're talking about church right? Anybody know where this is? Nope. Portland, Oregon. The hallmark of high architecture in the Pacific Northwest. This is the Moyer Chapel at the Grotto. Anybody familiar with the Grotto at all? Yeah. Again, experientially, this is... Um, disappointing because what you do is you, you park down below and you, you visit the grotto which is a natural grotto where there's a lot of it's very Catholic there's a lot of candles there's incense there's the prayer things and then you take a little elevator up and you go around and then you get this glorious approach to this building which from this end you know they say there should be no backside to a building this is kind of the backside of the building it kind of looks that way honestly but here's the front and the inter interior yeah, it's right on the edge of the cliff. I would not have wanted to build this. But how, here again, how do you know it's a church? That's it. That's the only reference to anything symbolically that, that says much about church or worship or God. Except that the space itself is pretty amazing. And if, if, when you're in this space and you look out over all of Portland, um, and especially if you go at night and you see the sunset, it's a it's an amazing experience once you're there, but the progression of spaces to get there is is really, again, disappointing. So, you know, how do we how do we get every everything to work together so that the sense of arrival, the sense of being there, and the sense of departure is all very godlike? I don't know. That's that's the mystery. What is it? Church. It's a bar. <laughs> Yeah. It's a barn that's been converted to a church. It's got a cross. It's got a where? Where? Oh, you window. Very subtle. Yeah. I love it. I love it. We did that on purpose. This is actually one of the projects from the firm I used to work for, and it's in Maple Valley. It's a historic preservation project. It was once a big white barn, and we did that to it. And just to prove it's a church, that's the interior. It's a it's um new community church, non denominational. Non denominational. But it was very difficult. Um, this had a hay loft in it, so we left a little remnant of the, the joists that came across and we had to restructure with steel. It was and we had to deal with King County. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fun. not fun. Hey, what is it? It's Roman. It's old. It's actually the uh, um, 
I know this. Did I get the rest? That's El Pantheon. Okay. That's the Pantheon, and that's the one that's got the big round part behind it. But it's the reason you're looking at that is because of this. What's that? Same thing? Different angle? It's a church in London. Thank you. Next one. Okay, where's where? Um, Notre Dame is one of my least favorites. This is one of my favorite churches in the world. And, I, and it took me some by surprise. And this is deceptive. Again, I'm telling you that architectural photographs lie. This looks like not a church because something's cut off there. So let's look at this a different way. Now is that a church? Yeah. yeah. The spire makes all the difference. Though. St. Paul's? Pardon? St. Paul's? This is St. Martin's in the field, okay. which is no longer in the field. <laughs> It's right downtown. It's right by Trafalgar Square. And I could go on for hours about this. The reason I love this church so much is that it's small. It's intimate. It's well-maintained. It's The sense of approach is good. The sense of invitation is nice. Um, just everything about it. And they still use it as a church. It's a tourist attraction in a big, big way. But they do more music out of here than you can believe organ recitals and chamber music. When Christy and I stumbled in there, they were having some music, and it was just lovely. And the, the acoustics are really good for music. It's just it's just tight. It's just right. Um, and and my favorite, one of my favorite things about this church, again, uh, let's come back here. This whole courtyard here and below is a modern addition to the church, but you almost don't know it's there. It's so subtly done, which I like. I'm not a historic preservationist by any stretch of imagination, but um, one, is that another Wren? Yeah, it's Christopher Wren. Thank you. I should give him credit because he's my hero. Um, this is a modern addition. The whole backside, and I wish the picture was better because that makes it feel like the window's melting and warping. <laughs> but it's so much nicer than that. It's in the midst of all this age and antiquity, you have this new modern window, and it's, it's just lovely. And it's clear glass, so you see kind of through it to the trees and things that are beyond it. Phenomenal building. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here. Where are we at? Okay, anybody know? Arkansas. Arkansas? Know the architect? I don't know where. It's Arkansas. I know the name and the architect. That's pretty good for me. It's Arkansas. For me, that's pretty good. That's Thorn Crown Chapel. And it's kind of, to me, the epitome of nice but silly. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it is a phenomenal piece of architecture, but can it be used as a church? It, uh, it gets an occasional wedding, but there's no congregation that uses it as an ongoing church. It's just a piece of art. And architecture without art is just building. It is an amazing building. Who had it built? The Thorn Crown family. It was E. Faye Jones was the architect. And he's done, he did, most architects don't like to believe that they have a set style, but there's probably <coughs> 12 of these. And it's all pretty much the same thing. You know, there's variations, and if you look at it in detail, you know that it's different sites, but it's all pretty much the same thing. But as we begin to talk about balance in a few minutes, we're going to talk about this one again because there's there's beauty and utility on opposite ends of, end of the scale. Right. Okay, so this one's way out here on the beauty end and means a lot to a lot of people. But again, for me, it's not functional, so therefore it, it lacks some utility. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the church. Church! <laughs> so, you know, again, contrasting, you look at this and then you look at this. And this has been a whole move recently in architecture, the whole user-friendly, user-accessible, you know, how do we get people in the door? We put it in a shopping mall because that's where they are. And there's, there's a really funny one of these that I, I was looking for, I couldn't find. It's got, um, what is it, a gun shop, the church, divorce lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you, if you look at it on the opposite side of 
parking lot was a liquor store. So it's, <laughs> you want to stop shopping? Yeah, exactly. You know, what does they say about real estate? Location, location, location. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Now this church. I, I put this church in because, is there a church? <laughs> what, what's happening in here? What's that look like? Dining room, kitchen. Yeah, it's a house. Okay, but you know that reminded me a little bit of what we did with Mercer Island Presbyterian Church with the Butterfly Youth and solving that problem in those situation. But yeah, it's a church. It's a church by uh, sorry, it's a house. It's a house by Richard Meyer. Richard, not Richard. Sorry. Anyway, his last name's Meyer. He's a famous architect. What is it? That's true. How do you know? So you're just guessing, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say church every time. And <laughs> I'm going to be right most of the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It kind of it reminds me of the uh, Opera House in Sydney. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess it, for me it has a sense of entry. I'd like to explore it to see how mutual it is. You know, it's got some sense of beauty depending on if you're in the background. What color is it? I can look it up for you if you want to. It has, it, it has something. <coughs> something you, no, I can't do it. I can look it up, but it's uh, it's a little liar. All right, and what is this? It's a rock show? This is a church. It's a rock show? Well, it's a church. It's a rock show. It's a church with a rock show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, clearly a, a current trend. One that's very popular, for especially in the megachurch world. I read a <clears throat> recent article about megachurches. They, they're probably a dying thing, and we all kind of understand that. Yeah. They tend to be a cult of personality, and when that personality is gone, it mm -hmm. becomes a problem. Um, and that's reflected in this, this kind of image, too, that um, also very much a current trend in, in church architecture is you've got a central church, and you've got satellite churches, video venues, Happening, it's happening a lot. This one's from uh, Flatiron Church, which is one in Colorado. They have three <coughs> campuses. And they're very famously in the Seattle area in Mars Hill. Yeah. You know what happened to Mars Hill, right? Mm -hmm. Guess where it's happening again? Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. he's going to do it again in Phoenix. So we'll see what happens with that. So one of the churches must have designed something for outer space to fly up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this could be. All right. Famous, who knows it? Christy knows it. Okay. Westminster Abbey. Yeah. Again, kind of not from the approach most people know it from, but it, it's. Is it pretty? Yeah. Is it is it expensive? Is it historical? You know you know my take on Westminster Abbey. I didn't. And, and the reason I didn't like it is I loved this, and I liked the approach, and I liked going in it. And then we started looking at it in detail, and what I walked away with is dripping in depth. You know, all of the side aisles, everything in there. You know, you, you get this, which is kind of lovely, but that's a, that's the choir, the little central area where the where the choir and, and things happen. But right behind that, on every surface, it's it's this. So to me, what does this church say about the congregation that uses it? So that's kind of our little tour through through architecture. In town. participation time. What is, where have you been where you've been most inspired or most moved or most touched by what you might call religious architecture or nature? Because sometimes I think that's the best architecture. Anybody? Well, not around the city. I was a member of Oklahoma City First that was built, <coughs> I have no idea by whom, but in the 60s, but it looked very much like 
We saw a lot of organs. How important is an organ to worship for you? Fairly important for this group. I'll let you know there's a lot of people out there that say, well, I love organs. It's, it's a different thing. So. What do you tend? 120th Avenue, 69th I was hoping some of that. Reminds me of sandcastles. You know, you just kind of take sand and let it dribble down. And it's very interesting. I think it's in Germany, the places where God is. Yeah, it's like that. Is it kind of open? Does it just have almost like a tent like structure around it? No, that's something different. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Look at this one. Oh, oops. I'm sorry. Northminster Cathedral in uh, York, England, mm -hmm. uh, is pretty typical, like some of those, but if you go to the side chapels, the first one, as you go back, has these windows, that, like a little modern, you think it was almost a Chagall bird, but it goes way back, I don't know how many hundreds of years. But some of the little panes of glass uh, are ancient and totally modern. See, there's so much more in this world I need to see. I think it's Sedona. I think of uh, two churches in the United Church of Christ that has a panoramic window that just opens up the, the walls of the, where the saints and the hills. And then the Catholics have got one like a church in Portland that's on, built into the court where basically it's uh, utilizing the beauty of the area. I think that's a real key thing. I think it was the first, our first church I mean, that I was in that I part congregational church which had to be saved as a historic thing or because it you know it's downtown Grand Rapids and, and uh, but it had the you know the beautiful windows and as a little kid you, you know I was just in awe of that part of it and I think so spiritually that's that's kind of what got me rolling uh, whether I could understand the sermon or not but I understood that that was a special Place. I always felt that there was a special place. So I think that's the same thing that happened when we came here. And it's totally different architecture, but it was it's kind of the same. Is that before or after the remodel? It was before the remodel. It was before the remodel. Yeah. Okay. It was before the remodel. <coughs> then I looked at those other things. <coughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Anybody else want to share your I have to say, uh, Rainier Beach is really fascinating yeah. for me. You know, I, I love this is my place. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Just being there, and especially it tickles me that the pulpit is right there, so you don't have to look at the minister at all, you, and you don't have to think about anything except that beautiful view out the window exactly. of the lake. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can't think of one in West Seattle that's got this. No, 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 no. This is Mount Rainier Beach, which yeah. is just okay. across the bridge to the Hall of the Sun. Okay. Yeah. Is that at all distracting? I mean, would you rather look at that than? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do better with seeing than I do with hearing. <laughs> well, I do want to say that even though my membership came from Oklahoma City Cathedral almost, um, I visited probably every Presbyterian church in the area. And when I got to Newport, it felt right. <laughs> the architecture felt right. Now, the interim did not. But <laughs> <laughs> I went away until you called Gary. <laughs> and I was here on the first because then the pastor and the church and the congregation all felt right. We'll talk a lot more about this, this building and this facility and its previous architects next week. That's really kind of the focus of next week. Yeah. Um, like, how many know what the shape of the basic building was modeled after? 
Is do you sense that when you're standing there looking at it? No. 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 It's, there's a lot of ordering mechanisms that architects use and plan configurations and things that kind of mean something to us that, again, border on silly because they don't really, nobody else knows about them, you know, but we know about them, so that's kind of that. Um, I, I was hoping somebody might say St. Ignatius Chapel. Um, yes. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not as great, sorry. Uh, yeah. that's you. Has anybody been there? I'm ashamed to admit that I live in a city with a world-class project like that, and I've never been here. Shame, shame, shame. shame. <laughs> That's a lot I haven't seen. Uh, anybody been to EMP? Yeah. I apologize on behalf of all architects. <laughs> I'm not very opinionated. I mean, there's things I like and things I don't like. <laughs> I wish I knew more about the people that did it. I was going to say, he's just really great. They're wonderful people. Yeah. yeah. Do you have names? I can't remember oh, okay. the names, we but they're in Stubble. Oh, okay. Oh, I've worked with them before. They were in North Carolina. Anyway, that, all that stuff. <laughs> Architects and churches have been getting along for many, many years. Uh, sometimes not so well, sometimes very well. I mean, there's the, the cream project for any architect is to actually work on a church. But not many people, not many architects want to because it's very difficult work. It's, you, you think about, there's, in the hierarchy of projects, there's church and residential and, and kind of everything else. And most people kind of prefer to do everything else because it's easier. Office buildings, you know, all that stuff is pretty straightforward. You usually have one person or a small group that you answer to. In a, in a residence, you've got a committee of two who are often at loggerheads. Extend <laughs> that out to church work, and you've got a committee of sometimes 20. I walked into one church one time, and the building committee filled a room like this. It was like 35 people. And I walked in there, and I said, honestly, this won't work. I said, this can't be the building committee. We will never do anything. I said, you need to select an executive board out of this group of you know, seven to 12 people tops. There's a reason I think Jesus picked 12. It's kind of the maximum you can deal with. Anyway, all that aside, there, there is a process that goes to, to doing church work. Um, I believe that. Yeah, it really is true. Um, the church and the architect have to work as a team, and each have their own responsibilities. The, the responsibility of the church is to set the vision. So you have, to, you have to set the vision, which also means setting the program. The program is typically a written document that the architect will help the church write, and it's basically a statement of the problems that the, that the building project has to solve. So we don't have enough worship space, we don't have enough classrooms, we don't have enough, you know, whatever, the, whatever the issue is, um, the church sets that, in, usually in, in cooperation with the architect. Um, the church has a responsibility to be involved and participate. It might mean hands-on, or it might mean praying for the project, or it might mean, you know, definitely means paying for the project. And then the architect has this, the, our own set of responsibilities. We've got to, um, we got to listen. We have to educate. We have to uh, do what I call mistake avoidance, and that's a delicate balance because it's it's not our church. It was when I did this one. But typically, it's not our church, and we don't have a lot of skin in the game. So we have to lay aside our ego and say, you know, it's your church. What is it you want? And we might be thinking, oh, that's a big mistake. <laughs> yes, you can have that. <laughs> so, you know, again, that educational component to say, maybe there's a better way to do this, or maybe we need to go back to leadership and say, is this really what you think you want, and how are we going to build this congregation or support this ministry? So... Once all those things are determined, then there, there's a saying in the architectural world that you can have anything good, fast, and cheap, pick any two. And, it, and it, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, if you want it good and you want it fast, it's not going to be cheap. And you know, any of those pairs that you come up with, that, that third component is in tension with it. If only it were that easy. Because there's not just a good, fast, and cheap. There's all those other elements we were talking about. There's beauty. There's green, you 
know, there's um, resource management. There's, you know, there's all of these things that live in tension. Um, I don't want to pedal down because I wanted to make sure I didn't. Oh, scheduling cost, faddishness and modernity versus timelessness and, and you know, those images that we looked at that said, this is a church. And how do we hold those in tension? Um, sacred cows versus new arms. And, you know, when I walk into a church to do something, First thing I look for are the little plaques, you know, and like the Hatfield plaque there. That would worry me if, if I were to come in to do something because I know that something <laughs> about that space is sacred and maybe untouchable, maybe unchangeable. And the more the plaques there are, the harder it is. That's why I want to be Catholic. <laughs> he, and I, he and I toured Gonzaga when he was considering different schools, and we walked through the Gonzaga campus, and it's like. Every door has a plaque. Every room has a plaque. Every room has a name, and you can't change that stuff. And there's too many candles. <laughs> um, and you'd be surprised when you're doing church architecture how many things live in tension with cost. You know that's almost always the thing that's dragging us back. You know we want to be green, but green has a cost. And can we? Can we? You know, is it more important to be green or to be good stewards? Um, <clears throat> Ritual versus modernity. Um, here's the big one. Music versus the spoken word. And we'll talk about that again, more about that next week in this project. But that doesn't seem like it should be a big deal. But you go into the big cathedrals, and, and one of the things I loved about St. Paul was they would stop everything every hour and say, please be quiet. We have a prayer that we need to do or that we want to do. And, and they ask even all the tourists just to stop and listen and be a part of that. So it, it's still a church, but that's beside the point. The thing is, it is almost impossible to hear, right? The cathedral is a huge, booming, echoey space. So that spoken word component really suffers in that space. But what about the music? <laughs> Phenomenal music. And that reverberation time is just rattles your soul, really. It, it, it's very amazing. But it's that intention. And can you can you make a place that's perfect for music and perfect for spoken word? Is it possible? It's not. And we're trying all these different things to make that happen. There's a new electronic reinforcement system where there's basically the entire ceiling is speakers. And then you can either, when the, but the room itself is dead. So that when somebody's speaking, you hear that person and only that person, and, and it's the first energy that hits you, and then it's gone. But then when the choir fires up or the organ, all the speakers kick on and artificially create that reverberation. So, but again, what is that? It's <laughs> super expensive. And does it really work? You know, audiophiles would say no, it doesn't. So there's that tension. Um, the other one that I that, really been processing a lot lately is accessibility versus um, what I'll call a sense of mystery. You know, so again, for a long time we were doing seeker sensitive churches which look like <coughs> strip malls or you know, storefronts or office buildings. And the whole idea was people were tired of the high church and they didn't want all the candles and the prayers and all of that. And we were trying to get, pull people in where they were. That was kind of the buzzword. So the problem is, you know, a lot of those churches were in the front door out the back because people really are seeking a sense of mystery and a sense of wonder and a sense of awe. And I think that that's what drives a lot of architecture that's tall and majestic and, um, you know, trying to create that sense. But I think that we're seeing a real backlash against that. And again, that's also what's happening to some of the mega churches. It, it just doesn't exist. And there's no sense of community. So, I think I'm probably running short. I, I've never taught before. So. <laughs> um, thank you, but I, I'm running out of time. Yeah, Harvey's talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey's a, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> He's a whole separate entity. And I can't do what Harvey does, and Harvey doesn't do what I do. <laughs> it's this weird schism that, that puppeteers have. But, yeah, but the voice of Harvey is always there. <laughs> I think that was a compliment. <laughs> Dennis, is there any 
anything where these Gothic churches are being modified, <coughs> made smaller to make that sense of uh, that was really just once you got that Gothic, you can live with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. St. Martin in the Field, for instance, they're probably small enough that that's less an issue. But even there, when they did their addition, it includes classrooms and smaller spaces and a small, much you know, kind of a chapel worship space that doesn't need the big space. And so even they've recognized that there's that need for the breakout space in the classroom. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, you've been in Benaroya, I'm sure. I'm just curious as to your feelings about its acoustics and what it does. I've been told it's a box within a box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You're looking at millions of dollars of study and, and acoustical treatment, and it's as finely tuned a room as you're ever going to see. Um, it, it's a real, there's a real art to acoustics. Um, and, and I understand, like, <coughs> if, it's, if it's this deep, I understand about this much of it. And <laughs> I don't know tell you it really is a box within a box and we we had to do that one time we did a church in in Portland that was a dome it was one of those things where they inflate a giant balloon and then spray concrete on the inside we use it for silos and things like that in the Midwest mm -hmm. but somebody got a bug in their in their bonnet and said hey we can build this for like ten dollars a square foot and we said well, okay but then what you end up with again acoustically if you understand a dome like the Whisper Dome at St. St. Paul's what happens? You, you can whisper here and the sound goes around the room. So we had a great deal of fun playing with that while the, while the dome was done. But then we're scratching our head and it's like, okay, we have to put music and speech in this space. What are we going to do? And effectively, we had to build a box within a box. And, and so when you're in this space, you can't tell it from any other church because we had to tune the surfaces, put in a bunch of sound soak, and, and temper that down so that it could serve as a church. But until then, you could stand in the middle and clap your hand once, and it would sound like an army marching. It's just amazing. <laughs> so acoustics are very tricky, but and fun to play with. But um, yeah. right, we're going to think more about that because we also know that that's your chapel that is known for wonderful acoustics. Right? Yeah, for music and speech, because I've never been to Astor Chapel. Oh, you haven't. Yeah. Oh, shame. Oh, shame. Um, I'm surprised knowing. Interest and your knowledge and, and your, you know, the, the yeah, there's just so much out there. I haven't I've <laughs> seen it all, so. Um, so again, when we're thinking about balance. If we're looking at a modern American church, one of the things that we have to deal with, <coughs> we very often deal with a master plan, which is looking at a site and figuring out the maximum development that can occur on that site in a balanced way. So we're looking at, what are some of the major functions of a church? Just shout them out. Fellowship. Fellowship. Worship. 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 Education. Education. Mission. Mission is, um, often doesn't take the physical space. So we, we think about those things that require <coughs> or meetings. Yeah. Administration. Administration support. Office Hospitality. Support. Hospitality fellowship. It's kind of that term of um, Parking, thank you. So it's really the larger <laughs> site of the parking. And then there's one more thing that we often deal with on a site, and that's recreational opportunities. Mm -hmm. And very often a church will not have a basketball court or a baseball field or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you think about all those things and holding them in tension again with cost. There's, there's got to be the right amount of worship space, first and foremost, in my, in my opinion. Again, I'm getting into not fact, but opinion. Um, and then there, all those other things support that. You have to have... There's a lot of churches that have a big worship space and no education space. And then where does that growth come? Because it's not usually happening in worship. It's an important, worship is the key function, but education I think is a secondary component. Um, so what we do when we look at that site is we say how much, how much worship space can there be? And then how much classroom and all these other functions do we need to support that? And then the parking is a big driver. And of course, Obviously, we're talking about the modern American site because we look at St. Martin's in the field, how much parking do they have? Zero. Yeah. Yeah. And yet they make it work because they've got good fans and everything. So all of these things have to be tempered with where they're at. But for a rural American church site, those are the main drivers that have to fit on the site. And then, um, 
So what we did, and this again, touching a little bit of what we're going to cover next week, but we did that process for you both, which was a master plan study looking at the entire site, the entire building, and what could happen. And I will bring next week the old master plan and show you how far we've gotten on it and see if maybe there's some excitement about running on the next set. Uh, comment that beauty was on one end of the spectrum and utility on the other and my mind just raced to this idea of like the Swedish furniture or some of the other and, and can buildings where the utility and the beauty are combined that's the holy grail yeah when you can get that <laughs> um, but it's, for me it's like the Moyer Chapel it's it's beautiful but only like 10 or 12 or 15 people can be in there at a time so well, that's what I'm saying about utilities. What principle, uh, yeah, well, what principles are there? Uh, principles that would, would guide you in putting those two together? Um, Not just a particular style, but yeah. I mean, are there ideal, theoretical methods? Uh, I'm sure there are. I don't know what they are. <laughs> use them even if, if you don't have words for them. I, mean, what would... I, I would say it, it's more... More that I admire them than I use them. Honestly, my skill level as an architect, I'm free, I'll freely admit, is more on the utility side. If you show me, I'll draw you a floor plan for how things flow and how things fit together and how they work, but I've always depended on others to, to put lipstick on it and to make it a beautiful package. You know, I have some minor skill in that, but it's not my major skill. And well, but isn't that guided by the bones? It's not the lipstick. It's the. <laughs> I think I think so, and that's you know it's it's where you find your beauty, and and I and I do find a great deal of beauty in function and simplicity and and cost effectiveness and durability. Those are my hallmarks. Um, but people like you know, like Frank Lloyd Wright is a classic. I think he got closer than a lot of others in terms of combining utility and beauty. But here again. He maybe had those two components, but if you talk about the expense in his buildings, you know, he's way up off the chart on the other end. You want the roofs a week? And, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And they sag, and there's all sorts of problems. Yeah. Um, you know, so who, who is that architect that combines all of that into a package? I don't know. You know, that's why we, I work in teams and why I like working with other people is, you know, I can, I can correct mistakes that I see happening and yet give them the freedom to, to make it that's it. You, know, you have to lay your ego aside and say, what's best for the client? What's best for the church? What's best for the, the team? What's best for the contractor, even? You know, you, it's not a battle with the contractor. They're on our side. And most architects will say it's a battle. <laughs> so it's, it's building that team toward the greater principle. And the reason I love doing church architecture is because I've got all of that, plus I'm seeking to serve God. And it also pays the college bills. But, you know, <laughs> so. Changing the subject totally, but I have often wondered in all those churches in Europe, <coughs> who, how could they, how could the architect, as was there a single architect when it's been over several hundreds of years that they've been put together, how does that all transmitted? Do you have any ideas about that? It's always just a mystery to me. There were rudimentary plans. I mean, there's even if it's just lines sketched out on the floor. There's some sense of passing that on because when you undertake a cathedral, you know that you're not going to be there at the end of it. And you have to share your vision. And you have to um, give the next generation enough information to proceed. Or you recognize, like the San Michel, um, San Michel, that later architects are just going to do something completely different and tear down what you've done and rebuild it. And you can end up with a real hodgepodge. Um, but there's a sense of greatness that goes with a name architect like a Christopher Wren, that future generations and future architects and future builders will respect that core vision while maybe modifying for new techniques and new possibilities and new materials. But if there is a vision laid down, that's again the, the goal behind a master plan to say, here's where we're going, and here's the little steps that we take to get there. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. But I used to love 
I always thought the best architect in the world would be a design build architect, somebody who's hands on, because that's really what an original architect in the cathedral age was. He was the master stonemason, the master builder, the master everything. He was the one that knew how it was going to go together. He could frame, he could do tile work, he could do um, concrete. And that's appealing to me. And I think that those people that have that connection with material and with the, the art of putting something together, they're better architects. I used to say, Nobody should be allowed to be an architect until they've built a, a building, and that they've built a building from their own plans. <laughs> that means we learn what it takes. Information we need. So that never caught on. Most uh, <laughs> <laughs> architects. Right. I don't know the uh, name of the architect that did Newport Church, but I know he's done others in the area. Will you talk about that next week? Uh, yeah, we can, I can touch on that now. Okay. And I had his name until you said I don't know the name. Okay. Um, but he... Yeah. Graham Anderson. Thank you, yes. And she he... Knows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll look it up again next week. But he, he had a very definite um, approach that was tempered by his theology. And he was... The, the idea behind his theology was that it wasn't a table, it was an altar. And therefore it was not, it, if you think about the, the, before the remodel, it was a number of steps, it was this big stone behemoth that you, you could move it if you had about 10 people, and you know, but you couldn't use it somewhere else because it was, it was unfunctional for that. It was an altar, not a table. And it was raised and it was, you know, there's all these things that go, Chervenac is his name. And you see that in all of his buildings. Again, they don't, no architect likes to believe that they have a set style. In fact, Graham Anderson's breed, um, Kathy Gunstone was Breed's daughter, and she was a longtime member at Lake Erie. And she, I used to say, hey, Kathy, I did another group, group at Dad's churches, and I walked in, I knew it was his, and she, she said, oh, he would hate that. <laughs> he thought everything was different and unique, and yet they're all basically the same style, the same layout, the same materials. And, and so um, Chervenac was that way, Graham is that way. Recently I walked into a church in Centralia that I'm working with and I went, oh, this is a Larry Morley church. And you know, one that I had worked on as a young, young lad in the industry. So, yes. Um, I forgot where that started, but I hope that illustrated the point. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Or do you want, do you want to leave early? Do you want to talk some more? Want to... Where are the other churches like this? I know it's in Homish. Presbyterian. Yes, the Homish Press is one. There's one, um, Edgewood Baptist in uh, the Denver area is a Chervenac church. There's one in um, Bellevue. Um, and some of these I'm guessing at, but I'll guarantee you they're a Chervenac church. Do I mention all that house? No, that was, um, that was uh, the Euphemians. Oh, you were to, I was thinking you were the original sanctuary. Yes. They looked Yeah, no, it's an A-frame style, but it's it's not a church. Yeah. So. Thank you all. Again, next week we're going to talk about this church in particular and the influence of other religions um, on architecture in general and on our experiences. So, there you go. Thank you very much.